Hello YouTube. Today I'll speak about the Russian Arctic areas and the UFO observations. Now, Russian Arctic area is a fascinating and very hard to reach piece of our planet and there are a number of UFO cases that have to taken place there and USO as well. It's a very remote area as you can understand and it's, it is of special strategic importance to the Russian Federation as it was to the Soviet Union before. So let's get started and go, go straight to the area and to the cases. The Arctic is the northern area of the Earth and it includes the deep water Arctic basin, shallow marginal seas with islands and adjoining parts of the continental land, Asia, Europe, and Northern America. Now, we need to speak about the city of Norilsk, or Nor Norilsk, I would say, pronounced in English. It's a highly polluted industrial city in the Krasnoyarsk region of Russia, and it's located above the Arctic Circle, east of the mighty Yenisei River and south of the western Taimir Peninsula. Taimir Peninsula is one of the least explored areas of, the, of this planet. And whatever can be found there is of tremendous value. Whether it be metals or archaeological digs and much more than that. The city is about 175,000 people. And it, most important, it's off limits to the foreigners. Only Russian and Belarusian citizens can visit there. I understand there are a number of Ukrainians who work there. I don't know how they got to the city. Maybe they have Russian citizenship nowadays. But it is a city that you cannot get into if you are a foreigner. It is of strategic importance to Russia. Basically, the city is located nowhere. It sits between swamps and there is very little flora. There are very few plants that grow in the city it's like slag all over the place and uh, you know just a few plants uh, the city was named in honor of a small river a narilka that's not too far away and the local people just call it norka very simply it started its history began in 1921 there was a russian scientist who went to the taimir peninsula and discovered many of the precious ores and metals. In 1935, they began the construction of the Palladium Mining and Smelting Company. Uh, it's, today it's known as the Narilsk Nickel. And the people who were building up the company and the city were prisoners of the Soviet concentration camps of the Gulag. And many of them perished in that area. There is a lake, like I mentioned, Lama, and can be reached by boat from Narilsk, and it's a very interesting place. I want us to speak before we get to the case about Marina Popovich. She's a distinguished test pilot she, of the Soviet Union. She flew 40 types of airplanes. She's a scientist with a doctorate degree in flight technology from the University of Leningrad. She's a retired colonel. She is the Lieutenant General of the Cossack Forces, and she's a highly decorated Soviet aviator. She's also a journalist today. She published a num number of books, and I want to tell you, it's because of her efforts that many Russian ufologists were able to find out secrets that were not for them to know in their country's UFO research, and a, a number of covered up incidents. She herself had personally observed UFOs three times in her life. And one of them was during the expedition to the Pamir Mountains on the, um, with the aim of finding the Yeti. There were 40 people on that expedition, a very interesting case, which I'll describe in the future. That included one of her daughters, and they all observed a UFO from the altitude of uh, 4,000 meters in the, up in the mountains. It was a spherical object. Uh, over a nearby gorge and a ray, it was emitting a ray of light. Now another time uh, she uh, observed the UFO with her husband uh, in the Mitino area. It was a giant elongated object about 250 meters long. 
there was an airplane flying below uh, and it was it wasn't very well you know seen in the area she estimated that the object was at the altitude of 20 kilometers and the ufo uh, left a vortex trail behind it what's interesting is that her second husband um, a retired general soviet aviator and uh, commander in the uh, intelligence service he had also observed ufos his name was uh, boris alexandrovich zikharev and uh, he flew su uh, su-24 su-24 in the dubna area not far from Lvov, now ukraine and he observed strange objects at the time they were basically coming towards the his jet aircraft forehead to forehead as we say in russian as coming straight at him the objects came very close and then just diverted their course and uh, left the area but they were flying without making any noise now the uh, uh, test pilots stopped uh, their flight and uh, they were afraid of any imminent uh, disaster the same group of ufos was observed over poland germany and switzerland and in belgium their photographs were taken so it was a very interesting case and of course the observer is top notch as we say so the sighting that has connection to narilsk she revealed in 1988 and i haven't heard much about this since and i have not found any confirmation anywhere else but i know marina popovich and i know that she will not uh, say something that she has not confirmed herself when she attended a flight school she had um, a classmate by the name of luba Vsanikova who was flying to 104 in the area of Narilsk. And when she was in flight, she discovered next to her airplane a cigar-shaped ob object. The visibility was perfect. And the um, airplane that was flying towards her, Yak-40, at, at the altitude of 4,000 meters, confirmed that they also observed a cigar shaped object next to 2104 i was interesting uh to find i was it was interesting to me to find out what year it would be that uh, avsanikova observed this cigar shaped object and i think it would be in the 1960s you see marina popovich as a teenager after world war ii she was a very determined person very goal oriented and she wanted to be a pilot at the time the soviet government was not interested in having female pilots they needed more babies after world war ii to put it bluntly but she was very determined and she went as high as, you as she could and i understand she was able to reach uh, the top soviet military commander varashilov to get permission and she got it so she uh, at first began to uh, do parachute jumping and then she was admitted to flights in 1948 uh, to be able to pilot a jet airplane aircraft she uh, joined the military service and with time she became top soviet military test pilot first class in 1962 Marina Popovich was invited to be among the candidates to be uh, the first Soviet female cosmonaut, but she wasn't admitted. That, that's also politics, because Khrushchev, at the time, he did not want professionally trained female pilots to become cosmonauts. He, f he wanted to have somebody f who would come from the plain people, so to say. Anyway, she continued her... Uh, test flights and in 1965 she was actually able to set a world record with with the turbojet engine flights 
Uh, she was flying an aircraft called RB. What's important, I want uh, to, to I want you to know that uh, she is a very, very intelligent person and she knows her field of expertise. So she understands that some people can mistake flying saucers for, you know, uh, parts of the rocket ships, maybe gas, swamp gas, maybe some atmospheric phenomena. At the same time, she believes that she and her uh, husbands observed UFOs and that UFOs that they had observed had conducted themselves in an intelligent manner. Also, uh, when I, I think that she and Avsanikova attended together the school, you know, flight school in the 1960s. And I would like to find out more about that case. But we do need to look at other parts of the Arctic area, those that are very attractive for, US, for UFOs, especially for the reasons we do not yet understand. And that goes back to the year of 1979. If you follow my research, you will recall that there are a number of cases and sightings that were uh, recorded in 1979 all over the Soviet Union. And, of course, I'm getting more information about such cases. Uh, 1979 was a tremendously interesting year. Especially if you lived in the area, I would say, from Norilsk to the village of Hatanga. Hatanga means big water in the Evenk language. It's a remote place, it's very hard to reach, and uh, I, again, it's very much of interest to UFOs. I suspect it's not because of the mammoth museum in the village that creates that attraction. Nevertheless, they do come there. Uh, files of the top Soviet UFO research program, Sietka, which I mentioned a number of times, that the files contain letters that were sent by Soviet people to various national newspapers and editorial offices collected and forwarded UFO subject related letters to the Setka functionaries. One such letter arrived from Norilsk, but the envelope was eventually lost. It stated that the military devices cannot detect UFOs, but numerous objects had been sighted visually and had been under observation. Any actions against them were forbidden. A UFO was repeatedly observed by pilots of Il-18-2154 and N-26 aircraft on approach to the towns of Alikeld, island of Dixon, and Hatanga. Um, the, uh, it, the, 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 the UFO would coordinate its movement according to the aircraft flights. Now, the radio compass functioned only when directed at the UFO. The UFO accompanied the same An-26 airplane flying from Hatanga. The captain's wife worked with the mother of the person who sent the letter to Setka. Now, the captain of the aircraft he later came to the pharmacy on the 27th of October, right after his flight, and told them what happened, and he drew some pictures for them. The captain observed a mothership. Its fuselage was about two to 300 meters long, and whatever was beyond it was not visible. Three spheres were attached to it. Each sphere had three portholes. They illuminated the visible part of the rocket, and below was the rocket's socket that radiated light. The object was observed in flight at the distance of one kilometer. It was flying towards the aircraft. Now, they started changing course from right to left, and so did the UFO. Later, it flew over the airplane, and one more time around it. It took the UFO three minutes to fly from Hatanga to Norilsk. Its median speed was about 10 kilometers per second. The UFO hovered over Alikel more than once, and the airplane changed course, repeatedly trying to, to land. The UFO was observed by all inhabitants, by workers uh, down below, 
and 100 meters of tape were recorded, conversations of pilots, air traffic controllers, military personnel, and the KGB that were on duty. So that was very interesting. Afterwards, after this incident, astrophysicists and other scientists arrived to work in the area. Everybody who observed UFOs, including the letter writer, were convinced that this was not a natural phenomenon, but something made by intelligent beings. Its flight of the UFO was absolutely noiseless, and it could move around at any angle. This letter was written in 1979 and only published 10 years later when Gorbachev's policies were already in, set in the Soviet Union. It was published in the Lukomoria Digest. It was a supplement of the newspaper known as Krasnoyarsky Komsomolets, and it was published on October 29, 1989. And the sightings were confirmed by a reporter from Zapolarna Pravda, newspaper whose name was Sergei Shvitsov. What else is interesting is that there is a, or at least was, a hydrometeorological station uh, in the village of Hatanga. It was established in 1934, uh, two years, by the way, after an uprising by the local people against the uh, mainland communists who were sent there to subjugate them. A very interesting history. Two years, in 1936, two years after the establishment, there was a hydro airplane unit stationed there. And they did a lot, uh, you know, they observed the local weather conditions and did, did other things. Now, the uh, files of the station can contain a thin file titled, uh, and I'm translating from Russia, Unidentified Phenomena. Today, we know such phenomena as UFOs. According to S. Ignatiev, who was head of the Hatanga airport, uh, 20 to 30 years ago, Soviet meteorologists had observed UFOs quite often. They described various UFOs, usually in the form of uh, glowing or radiant sphere. Other scientists observed UFOs too. Now listen to the date. On October 22, 1979, Lyudmila Kuzmenko, a weather forecaster, as well as flight commander Alexander uh, Bayazitov and his shift had observed a radiant sphere. It was located in the northeast, about 15 kilometers from the village, at the altitude of 200-300 meters. It had a halo in the, sphere, in the shape of a silver spiral, about one meter in diameter. The sphere moved to southeast for about 10 minutes and then faded and turned into a thin cloud, and then it vanished. The same observation was confirmed by a crew of Il-62, flying the uh, Petropavlovsk-Moscow flight um, at, at the altitude of 10,800 meters at the time of the sighting. They were 300, meter, uh, kilometers, 300 kilometers from Hatanga, and another aircraft and 26 reported the same phenomenon. I want you to remember the uh, spiral that was observed, the silver spiral, because I've done research of Chinese cases and um, I will talk to about them, of course, in another presentation because China is one of the areas of my research and I've published a number of articles about it, especially the Sichuan province. And there are very striking cases there as well. Now, back to Russian Arctic. In October of 1987, a team of Hatanga meteorologists was able to detect another unusual phenomenon. Descending from the zenith behind the Hatanga River from the southwest direction at an angular altitude of 60 degrees, an unidentified object disappeared in the zone of poor visibility. 10 to 20 degrees from the horizon. The observers clearly saw a metallic construction of steel color. The object was a cylinder of a very complex shape with a dome at the top. The object movements were accompanied by a smoky trail extending behind the dome. Air traffic controllers confirmed presence of the UFO. Attack helicopters were dispatched after the UFO was detected. 
but they couldn't find any traces of it. This information, as well as other fascinating stories of the Hatanga Hydrometeorological Station, uh, came from the site of the Russian Federal Northern Hydrometeorological Service. In 2013, the government cut the budget of the Hatanga Station, as well as others, and it was temporarily closed. I am sure with the development of the Arctic today, very quick development and militarization of the area, this station will find funds to uh, continue its existence. As for Marina Popovich, I met with her in Los Angeles in 1991. She gave me information for my research of the Phobos Soviet mission disaster in the 1980s. We also talked about the Soviet UFO phenomenon. I, I want to tell you, she's a great person, she was very much involved in philo philanthropy and other worthy causes. I wish her many years of productive research and long life. And I want to say live long and prosper, Marina Popovich. As for the Russian Arctic, there are more cases that I want to cover because it's a huge territory and it's a fascinating place, as I said, just as Siberia is in Central Asia. So stay tuned and definitely we'll get into more cases.